I'm going to talk basically about three things. One is the controller and the treasurer. I'm going to talk about what they do, the money positions in the state. And the second thing that I'm going to talk about is how much power we, the people, have. And the third thing I'm going to talk about a little bit is I'm just going to talk about how, how Jerry Brown is the worst governor in the entire country. And his entire team falls in that spot as well. And I will tell you why I do that. So first, I'm Laura Wells. I'm running for controller. And I'm just as pleased as I can be that I recruited Ellen Brown to run for treasurer. wrote the books on state bank. How many of you, when I count to three, say what state in this country has a state bank? One, two, North three. Dakota. North Dakota. You didn't yes. that. <laughs> so the reason anybody really knows is because of Ellen Brown. She wrote the book Web of Debt. It was maybe 2007. And she's recently written a book last June. It was published uh, The Public Bank Solution. So you can have public banks at the um, city level, county level, state level, which is what we're going for, and the country level. Sometimes people say, hey, North Dakota is a tiny little state. California is a nation state. Um, so they can do it in, in North Dakota, but that, what, that, what does that prove about California? <coughs> what it proves is that a state can have a state bank. The other countries in the world, the majority of them do not have something that, like the joke says, Federal Reserve is as federal as Federal Express. You know, most countries do not put the control of their money supply in the hands of the private bankers. And so California is at the size of other countries, and other countries have publicly owned central banks, where the mission is to invest in California. The State Bank for California would invest in California, not Wall Street. And I'll tell you just quickly how it will work. does not compete with the local banks and the community banks. It backs them up. So you would continue to have your accounts with the local banks, the community banks, the credit unions, and make them strong rather than what the bailout did, which was make them weaker. By the time the bankers had a little bit of money left over after paying themselves bonuses, they bought up the smaller banks. And they did not give the good loans, which the state bank would be part of providing, good loans to homeowners, students, and small businesses to make the, our community strong. So I'm running for controller. I've run for controller before. Um, and it's like follow the money. And the reason that the money is so important is they can go blah, blah, blah. They can talk about the environment, justice, jobs, education, all day long. And when the budget looks like what it looks like, we ain't getting none of those things. You know, so you've got to have the money right. So they talk and talk and talk and talk. Uh, David mentioned about no corporate money. Greens never take corporate money. There are some others that are starting to uh, jump on that bandwagon. So this is the part of the talk where I'm going to talk about the power that we have. There's one group of people, in my opinion, that are absolutely clear about how much power we all have. And that's the 0.1%. They know it better than we do. They know they actually have to have our votes. And they are pleased as punch with us when we do one of two things. We vote for the Democratic Republican Party, or we don't vote at all. Then they are happy. That is why they are telling us over and over again how corrupt the system is. Because they actually want us not to vote. That's their first choice. And then their second choice, which uh, is for us to vote for one of the two titanic parties. They're huge, you think you've got a party, but instead it's heading to the iceberg and the leaders aren't turning aside. So we've got two huge parties. And between, I mean, I've been thinking about this so much. 
And I tell you, I don't know which is the harder habit to break. Not voting in the primary, June 3rd, 2014, put it on your calendar. Not voting in the primary, is that a harder habit to break than voting for Democrats and Republicans? And it all depends on who I talk to last. <laughs> you know, I go, they're the hardest. <laughs> But we've got to break these habits. And the 0.1% knows that if we seriously start turning out, especially in a situation like we've got here with the top two primary, where only two candidates are going to go to the, um, to the ballot in November. But meanwhile, it's a lousy system. But there's one little crack in it. Any voter can vote for any candidate. So if you really want to vote for candidates that take corporate money, don't waste your vote in the primary on those folks. Wait until November and you'll be able, you'll like, probably have a chance to vote for somebody that takes corporate money and who will line up with the corporate um, agenda. But if you want to vote for somebody that doesn't take corporate money, then you have to Turn out in the, in the primary and vote for those folks. How do you know who they are? Um, if you vote green, you're safe. Because greens, as a matter of policy, know that if we take corporate money, then our blah blah is just blah blah. We just we have to walk our talk. And hundreds of people have been elected with the greens across the country. And it, even in California, there's been hundreds. Uh, but also, Richmond, how many of you know of um, Gail McLaughlin in Richmond. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit. This is this is still in the category. I haven't reached how bad Jerry Brown is yet, but this is in the category of how much power we have. Richmond is about 100,000 people. It's the largest city in the entire country that has a mayor that's green, Green Party mayor. But even more than that. What they did was that they were, about 10 years ago, it was a group of community activists, and they decided that what they would, they, they did what all of us, community activists and social movements, and you know, all of us, all of us who have been working so hard on so many issues that we care so much about, whether we have a 30-year-old daughter like mine whose birthday is tomorrow, and she's, when she's 30 tomorrow, and she's in the band Social Studies, check it out, she's really good. But whether we have a child, you know, we're worried about arts and culture being in high school or the environment, jobs, justice, you know, all of those, education for sure. Um, then they were community activists, back to Richmond, community activists concerned about all of those things. And what did they run into every time they were trying to do something but the brick wall of City Hall? So they thought, we'll run for office. And to me, the formula for actual change is this. It's three things, actually. It's probably more than that, but I'll break it down to three. Three is personal responsibility and personal, you know, where you live, with your family, with your house, what you do, what your lifestyle is, all of that. And the other is social movements. Take to the streets. Do whatever it is. You know, stop buying the corporate crap, you know, both in the elections and in Walmart. Um, and but and and do some kind of social movement, some kind of community activism. And the third is vote, defy the one percent, and actually vote. And places where they where they do that, community, act locally. You know, grow your gardens, eat 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 right, keep yourself healthy. Sometimes I think that's the best way to um, subvert this system is just just keep ourselves healthy. Um, do that individually, community, and um, and vote. So what they did was they started running for office in Richmond. Gail ran for city council. Then two years later, she ran for mayor and won. Four years later, she ran for mayor. That was 2010. She won re-election. And now she's turned out. And they also had other people, Greens, Democrats, and Independents, all pledged to take no corporate money. Now, who is what? Who are they up against in Richmond? They've got refineries. The biggest corporation in the entire state, Chevron. And my favorite all-time election was in 2010, when 
when Chevron put a million dollars into three city races in this you know, town of <coughs> Richmond, lost, lost, and lost. Mm -hmm. The Richmond Progressive Alliance won. Gail and two city council members. They didn't even have to have, I think they're eight, uh, city council plus mayor. They didn't even have to have a majority, and they started making a huge difference in Richmond. Now I'm going to talk about it. So, you know, don't vote corporate money. <laughs> If you want to not vote, then don't vote in any race where there isn't somebody that doesn't take corporate money. Don't vote there, but vote for the others. And if you've just got four of us or whatever, if you've just got, what, you know, vote, please. Jerry Brown is the worst governor in the entire country. I am so tired of hearing people um, blame only one guy. Not that he doesn't deserve a lot of, God, a lot of you know, blame. Um, but everybody says Ronald Reagan tanked the economy and ruined the finances and stuff of the whole country. Well, he was elected president in 1980. Some of you weren't even born yet when the real sinker, the thing that really sunk California happened. What was it that really started turning California around from the Golden State with great schools to what we are now? Jarvis Gann. Jarvis Gann. Prop, Jarvis Gann. Jarvis Gann, Prop 13. Do you know what year that was? It was 1978. Two years before Reagan became president. And it's what they called the tax revolt. And the reason they called it the tax revolt is that it was revolting. And <laughs> What happened was that there's a good part of it. I have to say that because there are people that just want to be really mad at me. Um, but there's a very good part, but we can keep that good part, which is to keep people in their homes. There was a huge problem. Jerry Brown had been um, elected in 1974. And the huge problem was that some people, especially seniors on a fixed income, had, but everybody, you know, like they were having property tax of $1,000 one year, and then about six years later, it was $4,000, you know, and that was, and even shorter, I'm, I try hard not to exaggerate, and I'll bet it's worse than that. Usually I don't say it as bad because I don't want to, you know, overstate it. But it was like, they'd be $1,000, then it'd be 1500 then it'd be 3000 and all of that. That problem could have been solved, but they were so desperate because Jerry Brown, having been governor for three years, did nothing, that they went with Jarvis Gann, and knowing that that was not the exact good solution, but they were so desperate, they, were, they went for that. So they voted in Prop 13, which flattened property taxes. Now, who have been the major um, beneficiaries of that? I'll, gi I'll give you one guess, and I'll give you what the two options are. One is, residential homeowners, and the other is commercial and corporate properties. Which one was the biggest winner on that? Commercial property. Corporate and commercial properties. They used to pay the bulk in, in total of the property taxes, and now it's individual residences that pay the total because they have all sorts of, of ways to get out of being reassessed, plus they don't die and they don't sell the way <laughs> residentials do. And some of these corporations should die, and that's what, uh, if, David, <laughs> if David Curtis were the, um, were the Secretary of State, he would pull some of those corporate licenses. I am positive of that. So Jerry Brown, now, okay, so we've all made mistakes. Some of them are like, pretty bad. But Jerry Brown had a chance to fix it. He was governor from 74 to 82. And then, 82, 18, plus 10, 28. 28 years later, he's governor again. He could have fixed the mess he made. Read any books focused, any books, any articles, anything that's focused on what happened to California. And a major star of the show is Prop 13. Prop 13 happened to California. And now, how many of you, I mean, this morning I was, I, my usual bike, um, method of transportation is bikes, buses, and buddies. Because I grew up in Michigan and I hate the car companies, and so I'm as committed as I can possibly be. And how long it took me to get here today proves I should not drive. 